I mean, we can start we can now. Start. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to all our guests for a special edition of the Center for Policy Research, the Vedi Center for Political Data uh, uh, Dialogue Series. Uh, colleagues who've been part of these discussions in the past will be familiar yeah. with this uh, election ritual that CPR and TPCD, TCPD do jointly after every election. The CPR politics team, uh, in partnership with the Tivedi Center, come together to uh, decode the election results uh, and offer some careful thinking and nuance into uh, the debates on understanding and interpreting uh, the elections. Um, and and our stellar colleagues uh, spend uh, hours uh, deep into the night and early in the morning putting together their slides and presentations uh, to to, uh, for these discussions. So it's an absolute pleasure to welcome everybody to uh, the special edition on the Bihar elections. Thank you all for joining us and thank you uh, to the CPR politics team, uh, Nilanjan Sirkar, Rahul Varma, Gilles Venier. I think I finally almost got the pronunciation of Gilles' name right, uh, but just just almost, right? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> almost. It's a, it's a great step forward. There was a, there was a time when it was guys, so <laughs> I, I'm moving in the right direction. Um, who will, uh, thanks, thanks to all three of you whose election commentary all day yesterday uh, helped many of us make sense of what was happening uh, and who will now uh, slice through different aspects of the election uh, of the data to give us a deeper understanding uh, of uh, how to interpret the results. Uh, and we are particularly honored to have uh, with us uh, two eminent uh, uh, colleagues who will comment on the presentation and also, most importantly, share with us their perspective. Vandita Mishra, opinion editor of the Indian Express, uh, whose reportage uh, during every election is a must read for everyone. Uh, and I always feel I'm, uh, my instincts are headed in the right direction if uh, they in some ways match uh, what Vandita is saying in her reporting. So she's my, she's my check and balance to make sure that uh, some, of our, some of what we learn in, in the classroom and in conversations with colleagues actually uh, bears out on the ground. So thank you very much, Vandita, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, we also have with us uh, Tebariz Niazi, who's assistant professor at the National University of Singapore, uh, who's also been very closely looking at different trends in Bihar, but particularly the, 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 the social churning that Bihar is going through and what implications that has on the elections. Uh, so we have uh, what is going to be, uh, I think, uh, one of the most interesting and important interpretations of yesterday's cliffhanger election results. Um, there's many things on the table for us to understand better, uh, about both the changing nature of the political party competition uh, that Bihar is witnessing, which I think was in part at least responsible for the many uh, seesaws that we saw yesterday, the social churning, uh, the, the new narratives that are emerging, uh, and also, of course, the overarching uh, Modi factor and what uh, this victory means for the JP in Bihar, but also for the dynamics of state and national elections in India going forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Rahul to take us through today's proceedings and thanks to all our panelists and to the CPR politics team for as always being ready uh, despite a very very uh, long day yesterday uh, on the on, on election day to help us make sense of election results better so over to you Rahul. Thank you Yamini and thank you everyone for joining us today uh, as usual uh, Neil and Jill and I will begin this these sort of like presentations with a disclaimer that uh, the data scraping were happening midnight uh, uh, and all the analysis kept on sort of like changing and what we are showing is close to what the final uh, uh, data is but there may be still some errors the big interpretations won't change but don't hold on uh, uh, the small mistakes we might make. Uh, Ankita, can you put my presentation, please? Yeah. Thanks. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so next slide. Uh, 
basically let me start with the big picture uh, of of bihar election so what the bihar verdict actually does uh, along with many bipolar results that came out yesterday uh, temporarily offsets the emerging question on bjp's ability to retain states uh, since 2019 bjp wasn't spectacular uh, doing spectacularly well uh, they uh, sort of like had a very high expectation from haryana couldn't match that uh, maharashtra they returned but then uh, uh, they had to let uh, uh, the state go delhi they lost badly and bihar was a crucial state for them especially the new incoming the incoming president of bjp jp nadda to sort of like prove his credentials that he can try to at least fit into amit shah's shoes who uh, expanded bjp across the nation between 24 and 2019 uh, what would be the big effect of these elections on 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 other elections that are going to happen next year i think very very marginally uh, all elections are separate in nature a loss in bihar would not have in, ensured that bjp is going to lose assam or do very badly in bengal but a victory does not here ensure anything in those two states those are very separate elections it momentarily does sort of like enthuse cadre and so also create some sort of resource for the for the party both in terms of money and manpower and also some sort of sort of media narrative but we should hold on to making any conclusions about what the bihar verdict means outside the bihar for bihar the verdicts basically suggest that there is a new era that might be emerging in in, in bihar and why would I, why do i say this that for the first time bjp even though it's the second largest party in the uh, in the house uh, it emerges as a poll so far bjp has been either number 3 or number 4 now uh, it 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 it's sort of like one poll which is going to contest against rjd so all other players are now going to sort of coalesce either around rjd or around bjp nitish kumar in some ways makes a history uh, he's the first chief minister in the north indian states in the hindi heartland who has got the fourth consecutive term but he returns with a more diminished stature uh, he only won half of the seats uh in comparison to almost half of the seats in comparison to the bjp he may still become the chief minister but his stature is uh, certainly uh, sort of like gone down in last 5 to 10 years uh finally uh, we we were all hearing about that the selection uh might uh, end up in a tejasvi wave that didn't happen but surely tejasvi emerges from the shadow of his father lalu prasad yadav and think of this he's a 31 year old person who had a good shot at becoming india's youngest chief minister in a state last time someone became chief minister of young age was of 29 years in puducherry so a union territory but uh, tejasvi had that shot uh, him in some ways uh, i would say like a student who studies really really hard during the exam but not before that uh so in in last 20 25 days he campaigned really really hard he was addressing 15 to 18 rallies a day uh he was very very focused on his campaign just speaking 15 minutes but somehow it seems uh the verdict suggests that he failed to break the glass ceiling he largely held on to the base which was created by lalu prasad yadav uh for last three uh, uh, decades so he held on to the muslim yadav base did expand a little bit but not uh, uh, uh much more uh, that he could have gained uh, victory finally what we also see that most of the smaller parties and 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 neelan and jila are going to talk uh, about this much more but we what we also saw that basically the two allies which which rjd has one was congress which didn't do ex uh, very well the strike rate of congress uh, it, it was uh, i think around 25% neelan will sort of like elaborate that more left uh, uh, front which uh, sort of comprises of uh, cpi uh, uh, cpim cpi and ml uh, ml did uh, fantastic in 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 the seats it contested so uh, 
some people have now started talking about, and you may see pieces coming out tomorrow or day after, left resurgence or left revival. I would say uh, sort of like hold on to those theories as well, because uh, the districts around Begu Sarai had all be, always been uh, sort of like strongholds of left parties in Bihar. And whenever they contested with RJD or Jantadal in past, they did well. So I'm not saying that uh, left didn't do well on its own, but the alliance with RJD certainly helped in, in uh, what they achieved yesterday. Ankita, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a map of Bihar, three phases. And the reason I want to start with this map of Bihar, uh, because the story of this election, in some ways, lies what happened across the phases. So phase one, which is South Bihar, demographically has a higher concentration of scheduled caste population. Uh, Bihar, in fact, could be sort of like neatly divided in two. So Ganga, the river Ganga passes uh, from uh, through the central Bihar. So basically, phase two had constituencies north and south uh, of, of Ganga. This region uh, has a little bit higher concentration of EBCs. Uh, finally, the third phase, which is North Bihar. Uh, so if you look at the uh, Kosi Simanchal belt, which is closer to uh, Bengal uh, and, and uh, Nepal border, that region uh, has a very, very high concentration of Muslim population. So demographically, these uh, sort of like three phases uh, look very differently. And what uh, we will sort of like see uh, in a few moments that election basically turned uh, in these three phases. Ankita, next slide. Okay, so this is the result you all must have seen in various forms in newspapers and, and, and on TV studios, right? Uh, basically, what happened yesterday, and, and that was the re like one, because the number of polling stations had increased, and due to sort of COVID protocols, uh, there were lesser staff to count the votes. So it took uh, longer than we expected. Uh, but more than that, uh, the two alliances were sort of like neck uh, to neck. Like uh, NDA finally got 37.2 and even M Mahagathbandhan got 37.2. So the election basically went to the wire. Uh, and, and it often happens uh, that, you know, uh, see translation of some parties or some alliances even with same vote share turns out to be higher. So it happened uh, in 2020 Bihar that NDA with 37% vote share managed to cross the halfway mark and win 51% of the seats. Uh, Mahagat Bandhan with 37% of the votes uh, got 46% uh, of the seats and others which sort of like had uh, two more alliances, one uh, in which uh, uh, AIM, IM was part of it, BSP was part of it. There was another alliance by Papu Yadav. Then there were smaller uh, players like uh, Lok Jan Shakti Party. So others got 25% of the vote share, but they got only 3.3 seats. I think in the end, there was eight seats to others. Five went to MIM, one to in, one independent, and one to uh, uh, LJP. Ankita, next slide, please. Okay, so what were the key factors in this election? Uh, in my opinion, uh, Nitish Kumar was facing uh, anti-incumbency on many fronts, not just anti-incumbency, but he was facing opposition on many fronts. So for him, the opposition was not simply RJD-led Mahagat Bandhan. He was also facing an opposition of BJP's expansionist plan and and and... Uh, this happens in politics, right? Like parties in the upsurge mode, they go for expansion and even sometimes gobble up their allies. So uh, there were rumors. I'm not sure how true those rumors uh, are or were, but uh, the rumor said that uh, BJP's expansionist plan propped up Chirag Paswan, who contested mainly on the seats. JDU was also contesting. So LJP also becomes another 
uh, sort of front uh, against uh, Nitish Kumar. And then in, somehow uh, during last two months, every uh, column and every sort of like uh, news report coming out of Bihar was basically talking about how non-performance in his third term is going to cost Nitish Kumar uh, this election. And so in, in, in some ways there was a, uh, like Nitish Kumar was caught in a situation where no one was saying anything good about him. Everyone was sort of like uh, uh, questioning uh, his credentials on, on, on various fronts, on his governance, and as well as uh, him sort of like uh, turning uh, against BJP and then against RJD, joining BJP again. So there were uh, questions on, on many fronts. Uh, the second key factor was how did individual allies, uh, individual parties within the alliance are going to do. Uh, there was question, of course, about JDU's ability to pull, uh, keep the NDA uh, sort of intact and, 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 and get them to the half past mark. Similarly, there were questions that RJD has given too many seats to the Congress. Congress may end up proving to be the weak link, thus pulling down the whole alliance. So there were questions about it, and we would see something like, did, something like this did happen. Uh, finally, what we also saw, because due to the rise of uh, 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 Chirag Paswan, uh, we saw fragmentation of Dalit vote in phase one, which is, uh, 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 which is the reason where uh, even uh, left front were also contesting most of the seats. So what we, what we saw that uh, the scheduled cast vote got divided, at least we don't have enough data to sort of say, uh, what was definitely, uh, definitely, definitively uh, happening, but at least uh, given uh, the result, we can make this hypothesis that perhaps in the first phase, Dalit vote got divided uh, across three parties. Finally, uh, 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 the second sort of like fragmentation, which may have hurt uh, uh, the RJD was rise of MIM in the Kosi Simanchal region. Uh, Last year, in a bipole, uh, MIM won a seat. Before that, they were never present in Bihar. And this year, they sort of like won five seats. And it seems they might have uh, damaged the prospect of uh, RJD uh, alliance in a couple of more seats. But now, uh, MIM, which had all India in its suffix, but was basically a party uh, uh, near Greater Hyderabad region, they made some dent in Maharashtra, but it seems now they are uh, sort of like uh, making their uh, suffix uh, true. Uh, finally, uh, it seems uh, that women vote uh, end up sort of like playing a key role. Uh, so we got, we all got to know uh, one day after the exit polls were sort of uh, predicting. MGB's victory that women turnout had been 5% point higher than the men turnout. Uh, and this is not a unique feature uh, in this election or of Bihar. It has been happening in past two elections, but I think uh, uh, people were not aware of it uh, on the last day of polling. Uh, and and, and, and uh, Neelan is going to talk more about this. Uh, but given that uh, both Chief Minister Nitish Kumar and Prime Minister Narendra Modi had been quoting women constituency in last five, seven years, uh, especially Nitish Kumar, it seems that this sort of like segment stayed uh, with the, uh, the NDA largely. So in the past elections, uh, uh, Nitish Kumar had a great uh, advantage among women voters of Bihar. Even the Lok Niti CSDS pre-poll survey estimates had suggested that uh, NDA might have six to eight percentage point uh, advantage among women voters, uh, which seems that it may, it may have turned out to be true. Ankita, next slide, please. Okay, so yesterday, uh, there were a lot of confusion in the evening. Uh, uh, there were sort of like even allegations that uh, election commission uh, officials in the district might be uh, sort of like uh, uh, siding with the NDA against uh, Mahagat Bandhan Alliance, uh, which may be true, I don't know, but at least the analysis of this data suggests that what we were seeing is basically uh, like volatility of, of seats changing hands, uh, 
when you know the vote count is still going on uh, in the end both nda and mjb had a similar proportion of uh, narrow victories and almost a similar proportion of uh, victory by very very high margins so both mgb and nda uh, won 49 seats with more than 10 percentage uh, points uh, uh, margin and both had around 18 to 20 seats which was sort of like narrowly contested so it was just swinging uh, in uh, from one uh, alliance to other it wasn't going only in one direction so all Uh, some some of us uh, might have the hopes that it may swing in one direction but because both alliances had, had similar number of seats that they were winning closely uh, that's where the results solidified the ankita next slide okay uh, so uh, leelan is going to talk to you more about this but largely this is what happened uh, in 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 uh, bihar yesterday phase 1 uh, 71 seats mgb basically dominates that uh, they won 67% uh, percent seats and nda only won 30% seats in phase 2 which is 94% percent seats uh, basically the election becomes much closer nda comes uh, from behind uh, takes a slight edge and in the final phase which is phase 3 nda basically dominates uh, 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 the election and the fragmentation uh, sort of further helps nda uh in in clinching the game so why did this happen there are four or five hypotheses one can think of and uh, neelan and jeel will present some data uh, to sort of like support or disprove some of those hypotheses uh and 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 uh, perhaps for some of those hypotheses we may never get data and i will leave it to your judgment to think what might have have happened so first hypothesis is that in the middle of october there was a confusion within the bjp's rank and file that bjp has propped up chirag paswan so jdu was seamlessly transferring its vote to bjp but bjp voters were not turning out or basically voting for jdu candidates so there was confusion bjp realized this that if this uh, rumor persist it may cost uh, the whole state so what you saw Uh, from phase 1 onwards bjp leadership doubling down to ensure and say out in public that no matter what no matter how many seats we and jdu win nitish kumar is going to be the cm so perhaps the resolving of that confusion uh, between phase 1 and phase 2 may have turned the game a little bit second of course one can think of is 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 the the fragmentation of vote that happened because of ljp uh, in in the first phase did the similar uh, uh, like did ljp damaged the prospects of nda similarly in phase 2 and phase 3 we don't know uh, my hunch would be uh, uh, that uh, the damage was much more in phase 1 and phase 2 and lesser in phase 3 the second hypothesis uh, and some people had suggested about this hypothesis uh, including sankarshan thakur uh, before uh, uh, the election that the prospect of tejasvi yadav coming closer to power is going to create a kind of counter consolidation right and his 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 argument was based on this fact that uh, basically there is a segment of of bihar population which sort of feels horrified with the prospect of lalu uh, lalu yadav and his party coming back to the power so they they would sort of like consolidate uh, behind the bjp the second hypothesis has two other elements one is basically prime minister modi uh, after phase 1 uh, came to bihar much more frequently and in fact he sort of like uh, gave a different tone to the campaign narrative it was between the phase 1 and phase 2 when he coined the uh, rhetoric or slogan jangal raj ki yuvraj so trying to remind voters of lalu yadav era so bjp and nda between phase 1 and phase 2 sort of like change the campaign narrative uh, which may have sort of like lead to this counter pol polarization uh, uh, and related to uh, 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 this is whether uh, women turnout sort of like increased in phase 2 or phase 3 we don't know that uh, at least uh, 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 my friend jeel who 
publicly puts out the data first thing in the morning. Uh, we still don't have uh, the AC level women turnout uh, uh, to cross check this. Neelan have much more sort of like higher up access. He might have done some analysis on this. Uh, third uh, uh, sort of like hypothesis would be uh, that there was, so people were sort of like thronging to Tejasvi Yadav's rally uh, because of his promise of jobs, because he was a fresh face. Uh, but phase one leads uh, uh, from, the, uh, from their own party men uh, would have made the campaign more complacent. They thought that they are winning with some amount of hard work. They will be able to uh, reach home. Uh, but they couldn't sort of like calculate the possibility of MIM damaging their prospects in, three, uh, in the last phase. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass on the bait to Neelan and G, but these are three or four big uh, hypotheses to sort of like look out for when they present their data. Should I go next? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, this is, as, as Yamini was saying, has become quite a post-election ritual for us. Uh, and I very much enjoy, you know, sort of hacking through the data with you. So, you know, Rahul was able to give us, um, I think, a very comprehensive picture of some of the hypotheses, some of the larger questions that we've had in Bihar. I'm going to try to sort of tie this up in a theoretical framework, but take a little bit of a closer look at um, the data that has been coming out of Bihar. And um, as Rahul mentioned, uh, you know, we are, of course, working with this data in real time. Some small errors do creep in, but hopefully, you know, nothing that, you know, overturns the larger claims that we're making. Um, so I just want to start with this sort of very simple slide, which is just, you know, the more things are different, the more they are the same, right? There's a sort of this, this, this larger view, right, that, uh, you know, there's a, this is from NDTV and, and it's, it, there's a bit of chicanery in this, in this, in this image because JDU last time in 2015 did not contest with the NDA. If you just take JDU seats across to the NDA, that's what's creating this sort of similarity in number. Um, so, you know, when all is said and done, the actual seat shares of the relative party, the relative seat shares, uh, you know, of, of, of the formed coalitions are not looking dramatic different, uh, but of course, um, there is some performance differences. Um, so um, I will spend a little more time talking about the spatial clustering, um, but not really offer any deep insights into what happened in phase one versus phase two and three. Um, I'll just say, I'll just leave it right there and say that my, my own instinct is that there are huge demographic differences between each of the phases and it's not sort of fair to say that um, something dramatically changed across those phases. Okay, so I want to sort of take our thinking, and this is sort of a strange thing to do for an election analysis about a particular state, but I want to sort of take us away from purely Bihar-centric narratives. I want to try to argue for you that um, what we have seen in Bihar is consistent with what we are seeing electorally across India. Some nitty gritty, there are of course contextual factors, I will also talk about them. Uh, Bihar is a state that I think anybody who studies politics and electoral politics has spent a lot of time thinking about. So we can give you some very detailed information, but I do think that in a number of ways, Bihar and what has happened in the Bihar election is consistent with what we have seen in terms of state versus national divides in elections um, across India. And so this is a term that political scientists use, split ticket voting. Split ticket voting can actually mean a lot of things. It has a lot of assumptions, but, but broadly in the context that I'm using it, it means that it is possible for me as a voter to choose the BJP, to choose Modi at the center, and to choose an opposition party at the state level or vice versa, right? And, um, you know, in a recent article with Yamini, um, you know, we've argued that uh, there are a couple of reasons why we might be seeing the greater onset of split ticket voting in India. 
there are two underlying theoretical conditions. People need to be able to broadly distinguish between the center and the state, both in terms of what the center and the state are doing, and also differentiate their preferences um, of the center versus the state, right? So these are sort of, you know, sort of theoretical uh, assumptions that are required when we think about these issues. Now, um, what um, I'm going to pin a lot of the sort of difference that we're seeing between national and state elections on is underlying centralization of politics with Narendra Modi, with the prime minister, and centralization in advertising around central, central schemes, benefit schemes, um, that is creating sort of complications for a number of the state leaders. And so I'm just going to give a very, very sort of brief uh, explanation of, of, of what this means. So, you know, there are a number of articles, but I think one of the best articles that have sort of uh, characterized this phenomenon is one by Rajeshwari Deshpande, Louise Stillen, and KK Kailash talking about how consistently over the NDA era since 2014, people who attribute benefit schemes to themselves, uh, you know, benefit schemes and, and delivery of benefit schemes are disproportionately now talking about delivery coming from Modi, coming from the center, and not the state chief ministers. And actually, um, in our 2019 post-election uh, discussion, Vandita had actually mentioned something very similar, something she'd seen on the ground in 2019. I think there's a strong sense now that there is a lot of political, political attribution to welfare schemes to the center, right? Now, that is a political boon for Modi, but there are a number of chief ministers who have been aligned with the BJP. Uh, Shivraj Singh Chauhan, Raman Singh in Chhattisgarh, um, and Nitish Kumar with the JDU, who have built their political appeal on broad-based welfare delivery. Now, overnight, the key reason why a voter might sort of at least uh, cut across basic caste lines and so on and so forth and vote for one of these chief ministers has been taken away because now people are attributing that, uh, the, the, the delivery of these kinds of benefits to Modi. And so sort of voters are left to stew about joblessness, about corruption, all of the things which are completely legitimate things to, to worry about. But it basically means that Modi takes away one of your most positive aspects and people sort of are disproportionately um, weighing on your negative aspects. And we have seen these sort of welfare chief ministers really pay the price uh, since 2014. So this is just, you know, a, a simple, uh, you know, characterization of elections that have taken place in and around the 2019 national election. I'm looking at the vote, the aggregate vote share in the national election by state, and then in the state election for the NDA or the BJP. Um, you will note that I haven't put Bihar here, but in Bihar, the NDA got 53% in the 2019 national election and 37% in the state election very much in line with the kinds of numbers that we're seeing here. We're looking at consistently 15 percentage point plus drops in vote share between the national and the state election, right? So this is consistent with a larger pattern that we've been seeing. And um, I attribute it to the sort of logic of this paper that I've, I, I, I've, I've mapped out for you with Yami. Okay, so let's now sort of go back to Bihar and let's take a, let's take a closer look at the party performance. As Rahul mentioned, there's huge variation in strike rates. Strike rates being the proportion of the seats, the percentage of the seats you win among those that you can test. I haven't put the smaller partners here because that can sort of throw numbers off, you know, uh, because, you know, if you're only contesting six seats and you win three, you have 50%, you win four, you have 67, you know. So uh, I've kept it to the larger partners here just to sort of show how massive these variations are. A 30 percentage point difference in strike rates between the BJP and the JDU, and uh, you know, almost as large 25 percentage point uh, difference between the Congress and the RJD. Now this, I think, is one of the things that made it very hard for exit polls. As we know, they went uh, completely wrong. I won't talk much about the exit polls. I had nothing to do with them, so I don't have to defend them. Okay. Uh, but I do think that um, the, 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 the key message, and one that sort of, I think, is consistent with the story that I've given you, is that Narendra Modi and BJP gained from the popular, the popular view of uh, of what Narendra Modi is, 
And um, I think the JDU, we were talking about anti-incumbency of Nitish Kumar, really paid the price of this, uh, of this phenomenon. Uh, you know, one thing I would just quickly say about the phrase anti-incumbency, you know, I think we all sort of, as political pundits, we throw the term out. Anti-incumbency is just explaining what we're observing. It's not a theory of anything. Why anti-incumbency now and not in 2015 and not in 2010? Right? I, mean, I mean, we need to understand something about what has changed. And so uh, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that uh, when we think about why Nitish Kumar became so unpopular in Bihar, we have to sort of look back to this sort of splitting of attribution. And nowhere is that more obvious than thinking a little bit about lockdown politics. Now, in principle, both the BJP and the JDU should have paid the price for the lockdown for the migrant crisis in India. We do now know politically, it does seem like the BJP has not faced a serious price. Narendra Modi has not faced a serious price. Um, you know, uh, public opinion sort of consistently has been in Modi's favor. But those same critiques, joblessness, you haven't done enough, so on and so forth, those sort of filtered over to Nitish Kumar. And that, I think, is why we see this kind of huge gap. These gaps, by the way, are not normal. I think you, many of you have been seeing many of our presentations. This is a huge gap. Okay. So what I've done here is I've just simply broken down the strike rates between these, these two parties in, on, on, on each side. And what you can see is that the BJP sort of consistently is keeping a fairly high strike rate, even against the RJD, Tejasvi Adav. The JDU is based, it faced a very, very severe cost against the RJD. So Tejasvi Yadav, when we think about his discussion of jobs, when we think about his discussion of, you know, uh, things that haven't gone well in the state, that really wasn't able to pierce the Modi phenomenon anyway. But it really was able to take aim at what Nitish had not done. So when we think about this sort of huge variation performance against the RJT, um, you know, that's something that sort of comes to the fore. I, I have more things to say about that, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it to the Q&A. But this is the story. Now, many of you will know that even last night, for those of you who are sort of following comments that I was making through the night, that basically the entire election and the volatility that we were seeing through counting was relying upon this strike rate between RJD and JD. When it went up to 40, 40 plus, the NDA looked like it was sailing ahead. At some point, it had dropped to the high 20s. Then it looked like it was neck and neck, right? And so that's sort of the uh, the game that, that was in play. So the JDU really had a hard time with the RJD. So one argument, and I think you know, Rahul has talked about this, is Chirag Paswan and LJP broke away. And potentially, they had a spoiler effect. Now, uh, there is some merit to that claim. Of the 113 seats the LJP put up against the JDU directly, uh, they won more than 10% vote share in 51 of them, in 45% of them. So what I've done here, for those of you that have followed um, our presentations, you've seen me do these kinds of calculations. Essentially, what I've done is I've taken JDU's vote share in every constituency, looked at LJP's vote share, and uh, talk through, given a particular proportion of LJP's vote share transferring to JDU, let's say, had they all been in the same alliance, how many seats would the JDU have won, right? Um, so the JDU ended up winning 43 seats. Um, it had 25% of LJP's vote share across constituencies transferred to JDU, it would have been 52 seats. Had 50% it, uh, transferred, it would have been 64 seats. Had 75% transferred, it would have been 71 seats. Had all of it, had there been a perfect transfer, highly unlikely, it would have been 76 seats, right? So there is some merit in thinking about a spoiler effect. Now, my own sense is that, you know, because things never transfer perfectly, because there's some dissension in the ranks at all times, we're probably we're, are looking at a spoiler effect around here. Right, so we're looking at a situation where, um, you know, the the uh, JDU would have picked up 15 more seats or so, uh, maybe 20 more seats um, had the had the LJP come come back um, into the fold. Um, it means two things: the LJP did have an impact. 
the LJP has made its political point that even though I only won one seat, I can make the election close to, for the NDA if I decide to contest separately. But it also shows that even controlling for spoiler effects, it is likely that the JDU still would have performed significantly worse than the BJP. So we need more explanations than just the LJP spoiler effect. This is the phase-wise performance. I'm not gonna get into this. I think Rahul has uh, covered it quite well, um, but uh, this is just to show that uh, there was this sort of flip across phases. Okay, I wanna end with just two or three key small demographic points. Uh, one, uh, Rahul mentioned, um, there's a question about how women uh, voters have, may have uh, shifted the election one way or another. We do have evidence, this is from Hindustan Times today, um, but we do have, and looking at uh, constituencies in districts broken down by 20 percentile or quintiles of, of, of uh, the share of female voters. And we do see a fairly monotonic trend that when the share of female voters is higher, the NDA is doing better as compared to the RJD. Um, and it's a phenomenon that we've seen in the past. Now, is it enough? Can we go uh, far enough down just to really pin it on which women voters, where it's happening? This level of aggregate data does not allow for that. But let me just make one sort of very small point about why it's good to look at these kinds of aggregates. So as you will see in the US, exit polls went off in Bihar, exit polls went off. Um, the reality is that even the very best of uh, surveys on voting behavior, and India's uh, voting surveys, I think, I think they do an, an, an impressive amount of work, but are not the closest to the highest quality ones that we have around the world, they miss increasingly badly um, because there are biases in who you're able to reach and so on and so forth. Uh, but by looking at aggregates, actual voting aggregates, you're actually, I think, able to at times draw a better demographic picture of what has happened because those biases that are coming out in the surveys and the exit polls don't affect these kinds of numbers. Okay, so um, this is, you know, <laughs> what we might call a mota mota calculation. Sometimes you use back of the envelope. This is like back of the back of the back of the envelope calculation. Let me tell you why. Um, it is very, very hard to calculate uh, migration data uh, in India. Um, so the last good data that we have on out migration is from the 2001 census. Um, so uh, Kanu uh, Pradhan, who is at CPR, graciously, graciously provided and collated this data for me. Now, because we can't actually uh, use numbers from 20 years ago for migration, those numbers don't, aren't meaningful. But the percentiles are meaningful, meaning places that used to have higher rates of out-migration still have higher rates of out-migration. So um, one thing that, that does seem clear, and I talked about the sort of differential lockdown effect, right, is that places that are above the median migration, which I've called high migration, and, and places that are below median migration had hugely different strike rates for the JDU. Maybe there were other things going on, but it does seem like the JDU did suffer in places with higher migration when they put up a candidate, right? We can see that, uh, you know, the BJP uh, also took a bit of a hit. Now this is because actually in these places, the contested vote share of the RJD is going up by four or five percentage points in high migration as opposed to low migration. It tells us that at least somewhat, maybe Tejasvi's message did gain some traction in places that have higher migration. It of course requires a lot more investigation than these kinds of data, but there, is, there are sort of a set of consistent trends which seem to suggest that maybe it is the case that the JDU performed particularly badly against the RJD in high migration areas. The BJP also performed somewhat worse. That this is where the concerns about the migrant crisis and the lockdown show itself. A lot I want to end with this one thing because it is the sort of larger theoretical uh, structure I've sort of talked about, right? Which is that, you know, we looked at, we can look at a lot of different metrics. There does seem to have been a Modi factor in this election. Um, it is interesting because for all of our local, local explanations, Modi is not a local, local guy, right? Um, 
And uh, in phase two and three, yes, phase two and three are different in a number of ways. But uh, this data again is from Hindustan Times in districts in which uh, Modi has, um, um, has, has had a rally are showing four to 12 percentage point increases in, 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 uh, in, in strike rate as compared to um, places where he didn't. And so again, requires much more unpacking, but I do think that the weight of the circumstantial evidence is pointing in one clear direction as to what explains the difference in performance between the JDU and the BJP, which ultimately made this a very, very close election. Okay, so I'll leave it there and hand it over to Gilles. Thank you. Give me a second. All right. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. And um, okay, so I don't have much to add to what has already been said in terms of analysis of the outcome and what has led to the outcome. Uh, and on whatever else I would have to say, I'm happy to defer to Vandita, who's a far better expert than I am, and who's actually contrary to most of us, if not all of us, has, has actually been to Bihar uh, during, this, uh, during this campaign. So what I'm going to do also a little bit as usual is to look at some of the representat representational outcomes of this uh, election uh, in a way that I hope throws some light on some uh, you know, misconceptions that uh, we often have, that a lot of people have about uh, particularly identity politics or class politics in, um, in, uh, in the state of uh, Bihar. So let me just start straight away. <coughs> so um, this is just to add to what has been said uh, before. Uh, if you look at sub-regional performances, uh, you see that, you know, there's a great deal of variation between, you know, BJP strike rates according to uh, sub-regions. So there's a phase effect that, um, that uh, Rahul uh, showed, but there are, you know, uh, entire sub-regions where both uh, the BJP and the GDU actually draw uh, blank, essentially in Bhojpur and, and, and Magad, which is consistent with what has been said uh, before. What is interesting is that the party strike rate uh, of the RJD actually uh, is much higher at the beginning of the campaign than at the end of the campaign, uh, when people started saying that, oh, look what a great campaign he has led and what growing enthusiasm he has been able to muster through the campaign. So obviously uh, the geography and the sociology of those regions you know, matter immensely and, and contribute to that uh, outcome, but as much as we recognize the importance of campaign effects, uh, campaign effects never took place, you know, in isolation, or they don't take place, you know, in, in a sociological vacuum. And a chart like this is basically helpful to remind us of that. So Rahul has <coughs> shown us this map before, and I'm showing it again uh, to show uh, what we already know that the uh, Mahagat Bandhan, you know, uh, performance was concentrated in those two, you know, southern regions. But what the data here uh, shows uh, is that uh, every component of the Mahagat Bandhan actually won their races in that region. So this is really not just an RJD factor alone. I mean, RJD won most, more seats in that sub-region because it contested more seats, but uh, this is where also the CPI MLL uh, won uh, most of its seats. Uh, this is also where the Congress wins uh, at least, you know, nearly half of its seats uh, and so forth. And so there's definitely <coughs> a much poor explanation that needs to be um, explored um, further. Now, when it comes to uh, caste, when it comes to uh, Bihar, one hear everything and anything about, you know, the so-called uh, I mean, between those who alleges that uh, caste party al alignments are rock solid and those who claim that they're no longer relevant and that everything has become very fluid, the reality necessarily is situated somewhere uh, in between. And uh, I'm sorry for the uh, ugly format of this. Thing, but if you look basically at this chart that basically combines um, the caste distribution within parties uh, among the candidates and the 
screeners, <coughs> you do see that the use tickets to upper cost mostly Raj. Interestingly, the Brahmin candidates of the BJP million observation, right? Uh, contrary to expectations, uh, the BJP did fill uh, a number of uh, Yadav candidates who did uh, really well, right? And uh, together with the GDU, they actually provide a good chunk of Yadav representation in the new assemblies. Kurmis, without surprise, are found mostly in the GDU, but these are not, you know, major number. You see that, you know, you hardly find any group that gets more than 25, 27% of representation, both among the uh, candidates and uh, among the winners. The only exceptions being the Yadavs, uh, who remain a third to a fourth, to a third to uh, nearly 40% of uh, both candidates and winners for uh, the uh, RJD. It's worth noting that in the 2015 uh, assembly, one MLA out of four was a Yadav. Yadav remained very well represented in the new assembly, but <coughs> as you can see, it's not just the RJD that provides representation, they get representation across uh, parties. Another phenomenon also is that you do find greater other OBCs, and these would club EBCs, MBCs uh, representation within the NDA. That's what you would expect. But again, you know, this is between um, 10 and 15% uh, of the tickets. It's not a very large number. And if you consider that those groups are themselves divided into a very large number of small groups, uh, and, you, and if you assume that these groups actually of politicians don't have much collective representation within the party that grants them representation, uh, it would be uh, wrong to necessarily interpret those numbers as some sort of a measure of empowerment within the GDU within uh, the BJP more particularly, especially when the bulk of the MLAs still come from um, traditional elite groups. Uh, I could have added also the Bumiyas, uh, which are also uh, fairly well um, represented. So on the one hand, you see that uh, <coughs> parties sort of cater to their base. That's something that we know. We know that intuitively. We know that from reporting. Uh, but the data basically shows you that those alignments exist, but it's only one part of the, uh, that's only one part uh, of their uh, story, right? Let me skip on that. So if you look in, in terms of long-term trends, you know, from the 60s to 2000, you see that the period of uh, growth of OBC representation really correspond to the rise of, you know, Lalu Prasad as an, an international election you know, the 1985 to 1980, 1995. And it's been, you know, somewhat, you know, slowly increasing ever since because those groups basically get included across parties, across um, alliances. And in this election, the fact that uh, the BJP did much better in terms of seats, performed better than JDDU, is simply translate into a small uh, push up uh, a small increase of upper class representation, but nothing really, nothing really dramatic. So by and large, since the mid nineties, despite the volatility, despite the regime change, despite, you know, uh, the suspense that election in Bihar create, those representational pattern by and large remain, you know, somewhat, um, somewhat stable. If you look within those broad categories, obviously you need to do that. Uh, you see that, uh, Rajputs and Takos are clearly ahead uh, among the upper caste, uh, <coughs> among the upper caste um, representatives among the upper caste MLAs. Uh, Takos uh, represent, used to represent about 40% of all upper caste MLAs. Now they've crossed 50% for the first time in many years. That is also attributed to uh, the BJP pushing for uh, Rajput or Taco's representation, the way they have done it in other Hindi Belt uh, states, the, B, the BJP in Bihar is, is, is no um, exceptions. 
And if you look at uh, the, the OBCs, it basically shows what I was saying just earlier, that the domination of Yadavs within the space that is available for OBC representation across parties remains basically uh, unchallenged. Uh, the, uh, obviously, they make up for nearly half of all OBC MLAs. Uh, and the rest of the space is basically divided among a large number of groups, right? Among which you find Kurmis, Kweris, Kushwahas, Banyas, Wohinbiar, ROBCs. But <coughs> there's at least, you know, 15 other groups that get, you know, some small representation, one MLAs, two MLAs in the um, assembly. Right now, I want to talk about something um, different, uh, which uh, has to do with women representation. So uh, there's a, we talk a lot about the place of women, the role of women in this election as voters, uh, but I haven't read much actually, or heard much, and I was, haven't certainly heard political parties talk about women participation in elections as candidates, as political actors, as actors of these elections. And uh, this year is some sort of offers somewhat a contrast, this election offers a somewhat contrasted picture because on the one hand, uh, you see that overall, the representation of women uh, among the candidates uh, grows only very slowly. Uh, and the reason it grows slowly is because two parties in particular have been making, have, have made you know, some efforts at increasing the nomination uh, of, of women among their candidates. That's the GDU with 19% of its candidates who are women. The LJP, uh, these are fairly new phenomena. These are not parties known to open space for uh, women in, 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 in general. And, uh, but the overall number uh, remains <coughs> quite disappointing. The, uh, the reason is if you look at nomination, let's skip on that, it's a little bit, uh, miss you actually, let me, stay here a little bit to show you that within the NDA uh, only the GDU actually makes an effort at representing uh, you know women within the Mahagat Bandan the record is actually quite poor barely 11 percent for RGD and Congress the uh, communists have traditionally and historically a very poor record at nominating women uh, out of curiosity, I looked at the data from 1969 to 2020 and found that uh, the communists fielded nearly 2,300 candidates in all elections that occurred in that period of time. And only 77 of those 2,300 candidates have been uh, women. The last time a communist woman was elected in Bihar uh, was in uh, 1995. And so the overall picture is that you do have uh, an increase of uh, overall increase of representation of the candidates, but because the parties that did some efforts at nominating more women performed poorly, it does not translate into gains in terms of uh, representation, uh, which is quite disappointing <coughs> and significant since uh, we uh, know that women outvote uh, in uh, Bihar election. Uh, actually, TCPD has the data uh, constituency wise about, uh, about you know, gender, um, gender, gender, gender participation. It confirms the 5% gap, which is wider than before, uh, which is wide, which, which has increased compared to uh, previous election. And despite all the talks about reaching out to women, uh, gender equity, that still does not translate um, into uh, better representation. Uh, we have a piece coming out tomorrow in uh, Hindustan Times, which basically shows also that the sociological profile of women candidates and MLAs is basically undifferentiated uh, compared to their male counterparts, both in terms of sociological profile, but also in terms of performance. So the whole idea that fielding women cons 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 um, uh, uh, that parties incur a risk by fielding, you know, more women can easily be debunked um, statistically. The last point I wanted to make, uh, and I invite you to uh, copy paste or, or note down the uh, link that is at the bottom of this page, because that will help you to 
uh, navigate that uh, that uh, chart uh, much more dynamically. Uh, it's basically a couple of remarks on uh, incumbency. So this is a visualization of incumbency that was designed at uh, TCPD. Uh, the squares are the winners, the rounds are the uh, losers, uh, and uh, whenever a candidate is shown from a different uh, color, it basically signals their party of origin. So basically those candidate clustered at the bottom of each column are the turn codes candidate, where you can basically see that <clears throat> their number was, you know, um, not insignificant, but nothing, you know, completely, you know, um, spectacular, um, nothing spectacular uh, either. Uh, you see that the LGP, for example, uh, a lot of people talked about the fact that they did uh, give tickets to a lot of dis disgruntled uh, BJP uh, MLAs or BJP cadres. That is sort of true. You find we find 12 of them uh, among them, including one four time BJP MLA, but all of them lost, right? Including the GDU who contested on LGP tickets, all those turncoats um, actually lost. Within the RJD, some came from uh, the LJP, same, same, some came from the GDU, only two came from. The BGP and the results are, are more contrasted. I just invite you to basically go there, um, <coughs> play with the data, and, and, and see basically what information uh, it does uh, reveal. And finally, on incumbency, uh, normally I would have put some nice charts about it, but uh, there was literally no time to do that. Um, and may I uh, express my gratitude to the team at TCPD who has helped and worked quite hard to uh, put that data um, together with me through uh, the night and, and through, the, through the day. And uh, so what we know about the uh, incumbency profile of the assembly is that we had 181 revenue incumbents 87 of them got re-elected and you can see that they were distributed across parties. Uh, 127 MLAs are first time MLAs, which is a good churning, right? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a recurrent feature of state politics in India. Most assemblies are assemblies of newcomers, right? Uh, <clears throat> around 50, 55% is the usual rate of renewal of MLAs uh, for the Bihar uh, assembly. So, um, and with a total of 243 seats, 126 seats have changed hands. Uh, and you can see in the detail that uh, it pretty much goes into every direction, right? It does not point towards a clear winner. And we know there was not a clear winner. There was someone who pulled through uh, a, a very a highly contested uh, elections. But even Congress managed to wrestle five seats to uh, the JDU, which, and, and they succeeded in retaining 10 seats that they had won in the previous election, something that they can uh, feel happy about. Um, and that's about it. Thank you, Jill. Uh, can I now request uh, Tabriz to sort of make his presentation and Vandita Ji being the most senior among all then can sort of like comment on all of us and, and say her. Thank you very much, uh, Raul, for having me here. So what I'm going to do is to provide you a very different perspective. And I'm going to talk about basically, uh, I'm going to talk about basically digital campaign with a particular focus on Facebook uh, political advertising in during the Bihar assembly election. And this, uh, uh, so what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes is to first try to look at, to make sense of Facebook campaign advertisement, why they are so important, and then what uh, and how different various political parties, they used social media for campaign advertisement, and then finally the issue of governance. So I 
so I don't know uh, because I think that was uh, uh, the originally planned thing. In, but I can also comment on some of the things that has been discussed previously. But maybe we can do it at uh, the later part. So basically, what I am going to do is to focus on Facebook campaign advertisement, and this uh, Digicam uh, project is basically the our Digicam Bihar project is basically the larger part of a larger project on Digicam Asia, where we are trying to understand how political actor use digital platform such as Facebook for campaigning and mobilizing. And one of the important objectives that we have here is try to understand the growing political incivility or there is a growing political incivility, incivility in political discourse. And that's what we are trying to understand and unpack. Is it closely associated with Facebook? Is it closely associated with the rise of uh, social media or can we trace back the growing political incivility even before the rise of social media. So these are the larger theoretical framework under which we are working on this project and we are applying computational approach to collect uh, data from Facebook and also Twitter. So we have also collected uh, Twitter conversations. So we have almost 36 million tweets, which we are trying to process, which the uh, data should be available in a couple of uh, days. So, uh, so here, even the Facebook data that I'm presenting today is not fully coded. So we still have close to 1000 ad, which uh, require coding. So here, the main goal of our project is to make the public make, uh, more take a more informed decisions about their candidates, about their parties, and also offer insights to the platform companies, how their platform has been used or misused by political actors. And I will show you later. And also to help journalists to get, get quick insights into the digital campaign of political parties. And I will take you through uh, the dashboard quickly. So why uh, advertising, why to advertise on Facebook? So what is the power of Facebook campaign? So here you can micro target, you can micro target based on age, gender, location. And if you see that your ads are not perform performing well, you can again re-advertise and again re-calculate your uh, target groups. And, the and it, this is much cheaper as compared to advertising on television. And one of the most important factor is it's largely unregulated. And I will discuss uh, that a little later, but if you are advertising on television or, uh, or even on newspaper, it, it goes through some kind of pre-screening. Facebook tries to pre-screen, but then there are, the standard is not very high. And I will show you why I'm making this particular claim. So taking you to Digicam Bihar 2020 campaign. So here, what we did is to monitor political advertisement from the official sources. So we monitored advertisement from Bhartiya Janata Party, BJP, Congress Party, JDU, Lokjan Sakti Party, and NDA. And you can see how we have categorized them. And just quickly to take you to our Digicam dashboard. This is our dashboard. Here you can see the overall advertisement figure, and then it could be further filtered by views, spend and views, and then you can also see week-wise spending by different political parties. So, um, so that is our dashboard, which you can visit. So if you see here, uh, what is very interesting that RJD did not advertise on Facebook. So they basically focus more on grassroots campaign, but their social media campaign was equally good that we have to keep in mind. But since they were not buying the political advertisement on Facebook, some of the posts they were posting on Facebook, it was not viewed by a large sections of the society, a large section of the viewer. Even if it was viewed, the share rate ratio was much, much lower as compared to other political parties. But you must also keep in mind that a lot of RJD candidates, they advertise on Facebook individually. 
So there were about 22 to 23 candidates who advertised on Facebook, but mostly only four candidates who spent more than 50,000 rupees on of uh, on Facebook. Usually, other other otherwise most of other candidates spend much lower. So this is Congress party spent much higher amount. BJ, uh, followed by JDU and then BJP. But here, if you look at the week wise spending, this is very interesting. So just before the first phase of political uh, campaign uh, voting, BJP is jacked up spending and then it went down. But then they look at the Congress party is going up. So we have, there are different kind of interpretation we can have, but just to take you to another interesting issues here, which is what kind of issues they were raising in the ad. So one was the call for action, which was either come for rallies, come for voting, join uh, the party, mem party membership. So it was both uh, the call for grassroots participation as well as online participation. And BJP and JDU largely talk about candidate personality. So it was always most of their ads were focused on Modi or Nitish Kumar. But NDA, JDU, and BJP also raised issue of Sushant Singh Rajput suicide, which became much bigger issue. But then they uh, of, they release a lot of ad in the beginning of the campaign. But later on, after the first phase of voting, all the ads uh, related to SSR was stopped. JDU and BJP raised women issues, governance law and order, infrastructure, agriculture, and farming. BJP particularly focus a lot on economy, which we can also see if you go to our dashboard. INC mostly talked about party and issues. So because they, so compared to Nitish Kumar and Modi, they don't have that kind of uh, personality. So Rahul Gandhi could not, he is, uh, can't be a vote mobilizer in Bihar. So that's where a lot of their ads were mostly talking about issues, economy, coronavirus, health, crime, law, and order. Similarly, if you look at that, this is very interesting. So there were ads about nationalism. So there were two ideas of nationalism, which I find very interesting. So BJP were basically talking about how they have been teaching China a lesson. So how they are, they are banned on the Chinese app and how it has affected Chinese, uh, um, China very adversely. You can see here Rajnath Singh. So this very interesting video you can see. But look at Congress party, what they were trying to do in several of their ads, they were trying to highlight the role they played in the freedom struggle, which was very interesting. So now they are trying to project themselves as they have a very long history here. So this was very interesting. And also, if you look at the tone and emotions, so BJP and JDU, they issued very less negative ad and most of their ads were positive because they were incumbent and Congress party issued a lot of negative and attack ads because they, they were in opposition. So they had to issue and attack ads to attack the opposition. And if you look at the emotions, uh, so, uh, so what was happening, uh, here is that BJP and JDU basically emphasize mostly positive emotion, happiness, pride, and hope. Congress party emphasize a lot of anger, worry, sadness, but simultaneously they were giving hope. They were saying that if their party comes to power, things will be much better. And so finally, if you look at, um, BJP ad, so there were a lot of ad that were released talking about Naxalism. So how uh, Tejeshwi Yadav or RJD is aligning with a party which believes in Tukre Tukre gang, so that kind of ads were there. And if you can see here, this particular ad, this was taken down by Facebook subsequently. And finally, about uncivil ads. So, here you can see most of the uncivil ads were issued by unofficial pages. So like this one, the NDA page, Modi Sangnitish, they issued a lot of uh, uncivil ads. But then there were 
several uncivil ads which were issued by BJP and JDU and also some of them from the Congress party here. And you can see here how we have cut, uh, coded uncivil ads. So basically any kind of message that shows disrespectful or rude tone and then use it inserting language. Then we have coded them for uh, incivility. And finally, the issue of uh, governance of the platform. And this is the big issue. So here you can see this particular ad, it was taken down. So these three page, Rashtriya Jangal Dal, Bhag Burbak, and then Bihar Ka Ashok. So these three pages together spent close to 20 lakhs, which is uh, 2 million Indian rupees in politi on political ads on Facebook. Now a lot of uh, ad from Rasti Jungle Dal has been taken down by Facebook, but it was much later. And we try to reach out to the all uh, uh, who about the uh, uh, sources of these uh, companies or try to reach out to these companies where we're trying who were advertising uh, on Facebook, they were unreach, unreachable. And interestingly, if you look at uh, this one, E Wizard Digital Solutions, they have a page, uh, they say that they are California based company. I sent an email, email was, uh, it, um, it went to spam because I think they, it was not working. So how, I don't know how the Facebook uh, scrutinize some of these companies that needs to be really taken more seriously because they have done a lot in the con in the context of the US and developed company and uh, developed countries to ensure that the platform is not misused but we don't see the same or similar kind of seriousness in the context of India and other developing countries including Indonesia that we are studying so there are definitely different standards and then a lot of misinformation come from the top which is official sources and they have, we have seen in the context of the US, they have taken down Trump's tweet, but in the context of India, they don't employ similar kind of standards. So they say they are not going to fact check the official or the politicians or even the political parties. I think this kind of policy needs to be critically investigated. And this is our final, this is my final slide. So, and this is, uh, this particular slide is from our post poll, uh, sorry, pre poll survey. And if you look at our pre poll survey data, what we found is very interesting is there were almost 19% of undecided voters. I know like uh, CSDS has much lower number, so we can always uh, look at how the sampling was uh, done. But then uh, keeping that aside, we found 19% of them were undecided voters. So if you are undecided, campaign becomes very important. And that's what happened because most of the uh, pre-poll survey gave age to BJP and, and NDA. And then later on, if you look at the exit poll, it was completely complete U-turn. So, and also there were, uh, in our survey, 26% of the respondents were using internet. And it, because this is voting age population, it could be much higher, like 30 to 30, between 30 to 35%. So the point is here, my point is that the RJD missed the opportunity by not advertising on Facebook because it could have certainly created a different kind of perceptions because we have to look at the emergence of hybrid media system. What comes on the Facebook does not stay there. It is being retweeted, it is being then shared on WhatsApp, then it is being shared in interpersonal communication. And that's why we have to understand the power of Facebook. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my DigiCamp team. So uh, uh, Jitin Vachari and Asha Damanullah both are at NUS. And then we have uh, uh, Abhishek Joshi who is based in India. And then uh, Professor uh, Kazuya Nakamizo who is based in Kyoto University and who funded the both pre-poll and post-poll uh, survey. So I will stop here, thank you.
Thank you, Tabriz. This was a very, very uh, interesting perspective on the uh, election, especially given the pandemic, uh, where digital mode was ca of campaigning was very, very important. Over to you, Vandita ji. How did we do, and uh, what do you think happened in Bihar 2020? And so let me begin by saying two things. One, uh, yes, this was not a very digitalized campaign, and but I think that was all for the good. I think there was something reassuring about the fact that in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, the, uh, politicians and voters lost none of their enthusiasm for a campaign which was completely out there, pressing the flesh. And uh, I do not think that the RJDs. Uh, holding back from Facebook uh, would have made a crucial difference here. Uh, the second thing that I would also like to say is that I do not really think that the campaign itself is so important. I do not think that this election was either won or lost by the kind of campaign that happened. I do not, my sense is not that the campaign changed from the first to the second to the third phase. I actually went traveled to areas which went to the uh, to polls in the first phase as well as the second phase. And on neither of the important factors, for instance, to, to take two, uh, you know, you, people, you mentioned that the NDA perhaps got its messaging right in the second phase after the first phase. I do not think, I do not think so at all, because uh, in both the first phase as well as the second phase constituencies, I could see and I think other reporters could see as well the mixed messaging, which continued. I do not think that the BJP made any specific or special effort to uh, cast aside the confusion about Nitish Kumar. Till the end of the election, from the start of the election, the BJP voter on the ground got the sense that there is a distance between Narendra Modi and Nitish Kumar, between the BJP and the JDU, and that sense continued right through. You know, in the second, um, you know, factor also, for instance, there is a suggestion that there was some kind of a counter consolidation because, um, you know, the Mahagat Bandhan seemed to be doing well in the first phase. Again, no. I mean, uh, there were fears about Lalu Raj. And on the fears about Lalu Raj, I would just like to say this. These are not fears just which are, which you can attribute to the prejudice of the upper castes. These were fears as much at the lower end of the caste spectrum as they were in the upper end. If the upper end of the caste spectrum uses the label Jangal Raj, the lower end of the caste spectrum uses other words to say the same thing, which is the Yadav right of way. So it is, it is not just, you cannot attribute it just to labels and to prejudices. There is something that happens when you know, the lower castes also feel insecure about Yadav dominance. So it is a combination of both. And again, this was something that was common to the first and to the second and to the third. I would not attribute this to some kind of, you know, I think this is also an alibi that exit polls and pundits are looking for, that if, because they could not read the election right, they attribute it to something that happened during the campaign, which either the party changed its tack or the voter changed her mind. So I, I would not go with that. Having said that, I think I would look at this election, you know, it's easy to look at it from the point of view of, I, I will focus on the three figures, the uh, Nitish, Tejasvi and Modi. Not because, um, you know, I, I never met any of these three. I'm talking of these three figures as they, uh, as their presence among the voters. So I, uh, when I traveled, I, tra I spoke and listened to only the voters. I did not meet any of these leaders. But I will try and you know, give you a sense of what I saw through the fig these three figures, what the voters said about these three figures or the kind of voter concerns and anxieties and hopes and aspirations that gathered around these three figures. So uh, to begin with Nitish Kumar, uh, Nitish Kumar, you know, I have been going to Bihar elections uh, since 2005, and uh, I still remember 2010 was to me a, you know, an, a very striking election because I have never in my uh, election travels have I found people counting out what the government has done right. It, it's it, it's always always you know what what the voter has not got. So uh, 2010, I think, was the first election where I started. In fact, you know, keeping a little table of and making, 
you know, putting down tick marks as I went along, that cycle mila, you know, um, uniform mila, uh, khichdi mila, school ka. So it, it was voters everywhere in different corners of Bihar were counting out the things that the, the different ways in which they had been touched by the state, which, which in Bihar was a very huge thing. I mean, you know, similar, if you, if you did a similar survey in Punjab, for instance, it would be completely different. The, the reaction you would get if you spoke of a successful scheme to the voter would be, you know, so what? That's what the government is elected to do. But in Bihar, one successful scheme, that's, you know, school, uh, the cycles for schoolgirls made such a huge difference because in a sense, the state had stopped functioning. The authority of the state was being restored in terms of law and order. And then also in terms of reaching out to the voter um, in, in giving schemes and subsidies. So from that, Nitish Kumar, who touched the voters in a never before way, or at least in the past few decades, in, in a way that they hadn't been touched in the past few decades, uh, to the next Nitish Kumar that I remember from the 2015 election, where uh, already questions were starting, you know, in the poorest areas, not, I'm not talking of the upper caste and middle class areas, but in the poorest areas who benefited from Khichdi in the schools, I started hearing questions about the school becoming a place where Khichdi is made, where Khichdi is cooked and eaten. You know, the, the, uh, I, in the poorer clusters of Dalits and EBCs, I would find parents saying to me that our child goes to school, he goes to eat So they were talking about quality of education. You know, the, in the previous five years, the attendance to school had made a dramatic leap. But the next step, which is the quality of education, was being talked about by 2015. That I mean, I, I that to me was sim symbolic of some something that was happening, something that was turning. Although Nitish, in combination with Lalu, won that election, but there was a beginning of the questioning of Nitish Kumar. This election, you know, Nitish may come back as chief minister, but I completely believe that this is not the same Nitish Kumar, and this is not the same voter. You know, I I have heard the kind of questioning of Nitish Kumar that was unthought of and unheard in the past 15 years. From across, you know, across a panoply of issues, like you start with, it's, it's an incomplete empowerment, it's Apache Vikas, it is, it is uh, corruption at lower level, the Thana, there is no big corruption scandal against Nitish Kumar to date, but the Thana's Tehsil corruption, the bribes at the lower level, particularly in the registration of land, you know, uh, the, then uh, it's, 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 it's there in the handling of the pandemic, you know, that uh, yes, we got free uh, uh, rice and free wheat and free uh, dal, but, but we did not get spices and vegetables. Yes, Yes, we got this, but we didn't get that. Uh, it's it's there in the in the handling of the flood, which for, unfortunately for Nitish Kumar came amid the pandemic. And so even you know private initiatives which could have helped the state reach out more to the people weren't there. So the state failures were more starkly written there. Then it is there in the in the failure, the complete failure of the prohibition policy. The one the term that you heard across Bihar this time was that you get home delivery of liquor now. So the well-heeled can get it in their, in their homes and the poor must buy more expensive and spurious liquor, liquor. So across a range of issues, but across these issues, the two voices that stood out for me, again, if I compare the voter voices that I heard in this election to the voter voices I heard in 2015 and 2010, there were two kinds, I would say there were two, uh, questions or concerns that voters articulated, which I had not heard them do before in the previous elections. The first was that, why should I have to leave Bihar to work? So I think this question came front and center because this was, a, this was basically an election being held amid the pandemic. And those visuals of Bihar, uh, Bihari men, women, children walking on those long highways home had struck home. And this was a question I heard across board in the poorer clusters, as well as you know, in the middle class homes. And 
particularly, in fact, I would say, amongst the slightly well-educated uh, Dalits and backward castes, I heard this again and again, that what is this development that Nitish talks about? What is this development that we have got? If to work, I must leave my home, I must leave my state. So this is one question that I had, no, I mean, Bihar has been a state that has sent out many more migrants than any other state even earlier, but because of the pandemic, the, this, the, this was a question that I hadn't heard before, and that, which, which I heard this time. The second kind of question is also something that I, I don't remember, you know, uh, hearing in the, in the way that I heard in, the, uh, in this election, which is, in many, many places, I found that people who were benefiting from schemes, for instance, particularly, I, uh, this, there is a Nal Jal Yojana, which is about giving taps to every home, which is part of Nitish Kumar's program of Saat Nishche, which is the seven res results. Uh, in most places that I went to, and again, I'm talking of the poorer clusters where who would be recipient, who would be beneficiaries or labharthis of this scheme, I would hear somebody or the other say that, look at the way the scheme has been done, implemented. You have, you know, there is my chapakal. The chapakal is the hand pump. and There is my tap. You will find even today that the chapakal, I get my water from the chapakal, the hand pump, not the tap, because the tap is installed, but you know, the maintenance hasn't happened or the water hasn't come or the, you know, there has been no, um, uh, the, the, the motor wasn't fixed. So this is a waste of money. You should have left me with the hand pump and used those resources to reopen a factory. You know, so the, the, this, the sense being that you, the state is misspending its resources on the subsidies that it is promising to me and not delivering properly. Instead of that, why does the state not create a job which will enable me to be independent of the state and its subsidy? So this was a question that I, I mean, I have not heard before in Bihar, because this is a state which is dependent on state subsidy, where people are made dependent and kept dependent on state subsidies. And yet I found a certain kind of a questioning of that whole paradigm. What is Vikas? What is Vikas if we have to leave the state? What is Vikas if it keeps me dependent on the state? So this is a new voter. And my submission is that Nitish is the same Nitish. Nitish has not taken the next step. The voter of Bihar is taking the next step. Nitish has refused to do that. Now, either it is a failure of political will or political imagination, or simply the result of the fact that Nitish in his second, in his, uh, particularly in the last five years, because of his, the political instability and because of his changing of sides uh, and the fact that he, he feels the need, he doesn't, he lacks the conviction and perhaps, and also the numbers to be on his own. So uh, it, as a result, you have a plateauing of, you know, the development paradigm of Mitish Kumar, where the Bihar voter, for instance, is asking newer and different questions and asking for the next step and the government is not providing him him and her that so i would say that underlying all that we see in this verdict is a different bihar voter and a greater questioning of nitish kumar which he will have to face even if he comes back as chief minister the second figure is of Tejasvi Yadav. Now again, I, I mean, I, I went to a rally and I spoke about Tejasvi Yadav to every voter. My sense, and that is what I wrote, I'm not, this is not a post uh, result uh, wisdom. I wrote about this saying that things did not seem to be adding up for Tejasvi simply because the leader is not simply how the leader projects himself or herself in her campaign. The leader is also how the voter speaks of the leader. And in that, Tejasvi to me never seemed to be a presence among the people. This was an anti-Nitish verdict. This was a people looking for somebody on the other side. But my sense constantly was that they were looking for an Arvind Kejriwal-esque figure. I'm not, I am not here you know, uh, this is not anything in support of Adivin Kejriwal or his politics. But what I am saying is that 
the phenomena of Kejriwal, if it, you know, just at the very basic level, what it represented was this outsider, this third alternative, this somebody who has a clean slate, who comes from outside and who is not tainted by the, the failures and the records and the distortions of those records of the others. So I think what Bihar was looking for, I mean, to me, their, the vote for Tejasvi seemed to be a variation of a nota vote, none of the above. I do not want Nitish. And so since I don't have anybody else out there, I could give Tejasvi. And this was uh, despite the fact that this time, again, in this election, what seemed to me new, which was different from every other election that I've you know, reported from Bihar, was that the RGD seemed to have a new sense of the fact that it needed to repackage and reinvent itself. And uh, I, I, you know, I sat with some of uh, the team of Tejasvi and I had some conversations with them. Apart from that, you know, from whatever I could see in the campaign. So there were three, four things that they did, which again were new. One, there was no Lalu in the campaign. There was no photograph, no mention, nothing. Second, the, the slogan. So this 10 lakh jobs, or uh, there was a specific slogan about, uh, with, you know, on banners, which were very Modi-like banners with, you know, just they just be on them and uh, some some uh, slogan there and nobody else and uh, so one of those said that uh, you know samajik nyay ho gaya ab ab arthik nyay ki bari hai so it, basically that social justice has happened now we will do economic justice the third different thing that they did was in terms of not just the absence of lalu and the change of slogan there was also a different kind of a ticket distribution so they had they sort of copied that prashant kishore model of you know somebody sitting with the laptop and looking at the caste distribution locally and then distributing tickets according to the predominance of different caste groups in different places this was not how it happened earlier now it may have not fully followed that model either but there was a very visible shift yet i think these all these things did not add up because they just we were still just that you know that whirlwind kind of a tour uh, helicoptering into places and taking off again there was no narrative that that need and narratives need to be built over time the, he he did not have the time he did not give himself the time and all these different steps that were taken to reinvent and repackage were too few i think he i think this is the beginning of tejasvi yadav this was not his election to win this was nitish's election to lose but we will probably see the beginning of tejasvi yadav if he is able to build on all these different beginnings that he has made the last uh, figure is uh, modi of course now again uh, here i would say two things one again and again my sense was every place that i stopped and every voter almost every voter group that i spoke to uh, the sense was that this is not modi's election this modi ji ko to bitha diya we have given him the vote and he is the prime minister so the split ticket phenomenon was very much in evidence that this even if i vote and support Modi, that does not automatically translate into my vote and support for his candidate in this state election. Because this is a state election. The Modi election has happened and I have voted already. But in this election, it need not translate that my vote for Modi trans becomes a vote for the NDA here. So I can be opposed to Nitish fully and vehemently while supporting Modi. And again, more often than not, this was how it was that most people I spoke to were, and again, across the caste spectrum, I think Modi's support and popularity has not dimmed. That was the one, you know, large impression, again, I came away with. So one is the split ticket voting. The other is, uh, you know, there is a layering of Modi's message and a layering of Modi's appeal, which is what uh, it, I mean, I, I, I felt this the first time in the, I mean, I, I felt it in the last couple of elections, but again, this was confirmed. So Modi is, gives you so many reasons to support him. It's, you know, if you're a Hindu, you know, he tells you I am your mascot because I will build your mandir. If you are, you know, somebody who, uh, 
defines himself as a nationalist, I have taken the fight into Pakistan's camp, so you can support me. If you are looking for somebody who's a, out, you know, who's who seems larger than your the caste and family groups and their tyrannies, their local tyrannies. Here I am. I don't have family, and I I I am larger than caste, and I am larger than. Uh, uh, you know your region so uh, the, uh, uh, again if you are looking for some kind of severe disruption from the past so here I am the risk taker who did demonetization and don't blame the failures on me because I am the big ideas guy I am the large thinker and uh, the implementation is on the smaller guys and they, they must be punished for those so I mean, he, uh, I think there is a layering, I think the message to me as somebody who is a student of politics, it would be that uh, the, you know, you, it's for Modi, it is Hindutva plus and that plus has a lot to it. So it, it is, it would be, uh, it would not be seeing Modi properly to reduce him to Hindutva because I think there is a lot of layers that he adds to Hindutva. And I think that's where Tejasvi has made a beginning, a small beginning where he is trying to project himself as caste plus. So again, he's not doing away with caste, just like Modi has never done away with Hindutva. You keep your core appeal and you build layers on it. So you do not repudiate your core appeal, you build on it. That is the crucial Modi phenomena to me, which I think leaders like Tejasvi and uh, the fact that Tejasvi is doing this is significant because RJD seemed to be a party caught in the past. It doesn't seem to me to be so anymore. So there is a layering of the message that has begun, a kind of a multi-vocal communication that has begun. And as it is an acknowledgement that in the time of Modi, perhaps every leader needs to do something like this. I'll stop there. Rahul, you're muted. Thank you, Vadita ji, uh, uh, for that great uh, sort of like presentation. And I, the, I think the take takeaway line from uh, your remark is that this wasn't Tejasvi's election to win, but this was Nitish's election to lose. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In a way, what you are suggesting is that there was uh, anti-incumbency against Nitish Kumar, but they couldn't trust Tejasvi enough to sort of like vote for him. Uh, so he has arrived on the scene, but it will take some time for people to think that he's their leader whom uh, 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 they can vote. Uh, so I'll uh, sort of like pick some questions which people have been sending me on Q&A and I'll urge everyone to sort of keep sending those questions. I will just twist and turn and ask uh, panelists uh, some of your questions and try to get some answer. So Vandita ji, let me start with you because you made a very, very provocative uh, statement uh, in your remark. Uh, it somewhat hurt me also. You said that uh, campaigns don't matter. Uh, is it uh, sort of no, like... No. <laughs> I'm sorry if I, I, you know, just to make my point, I uh, over made it. So I'm not saying they don't matter. I just thought that was not the dominant uh, change. Yeah, it was not the dominant factor. Okay, okay. Uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm back in the game. So <laughs> I can apply for the job of campaign manager. Uh, uh, Neelan, uh, there have been a couple of questions on, on uh, migrant uh, uh, voters and what uh, uh, that might have done to this uh, election campaign. Uh, so uh, is it possible for you to sort of like speak a little bit more uh, given the constraint of, of the data on uh, on migrant, uh, especially uh, in the high migration, low migration area, whether turnout <laughs> was lower or higher there, do you have anything to sort of add on this uh, factor? So I haven't uh, delved further in because, as I said, you know, I don't trust the data beyond a certain level. But uh, you know, because I'm talking about me above median, below median, we're talking about broadly 50% of the constituencies on one side, 50% of the constituencies on the other side. What I will say, though, um, you know, about sort of trying to parse out this effect is that, um, you know, the, the challenge is not 
to look at migration abstractly. The challenge in Bihar is to look at migration in its nuance, right? You have uh, migration within state, you have migration across state boundaries, but within country, you have international migration. You have, I mean, and you think all matter, like for instance, you know, Simanchal, international migration matters, right? I mean, it's like there, 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 are, there are things to, to, to sort of unpack that. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, th that's what I would, I, I would say about that. I mean, I, you know, and, and because I didn't get a chance to spend time on the ground, uh, like I have in all elections past, um, it's hard to sort of. Okay. One more question for you, which is by Sadhya uh, your colleague, uh, he's asking you, Neeland, it is still a puzzle that negative shocks affect BJP much less than regional parties, especially given your comment about greater attribution of policies. Uh, to the center as opposed to states. So, so I think let me take that. And there's a question about spoil, uh, how to think about spoilers and, and measure uh, in, in one go, because, you know, Sabya Sachi is uh, not only a friend and a colleague at Ashoka, but we actually, in some sense, are in the same wing of, of, of our disciplines, which is political economy. We use similar tools of game theory and data. So let me just sort of uh, take, well, you know, maybe 10, 15 seconds to sort of underline, you know, you know, underline sort of what I think is happening when we think about uh, political attribution in migration, lockdown, delivery, so on and so forth. So the question that, you know, one might want to ask is if I'm voting uh, for a, 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 a candidate over one other candidate, right? What are the positives I can I, I can say about this uh, candidate? What are the negatives I can say about this candidate? Right, and how do I compare it with the other? Right, it's sort of a very simple sort of decision. Now, what is interesting about the sort of era, the Modi era, right, is the sort of unrelenting advertising around what is delivered, right? And 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 I actually have an op-ed about this tomorrow as well. And Prashant Jha has written a lot about this as well, right? That it is not just simply me having given you something, but it is also me advertising very well. Having ground level uh, party cadres also staying on message and then sort of advertising exactly that kind of delivery. And Rahul, you've talked about this as well, right? So, uh, you know, I think that when we think about preference formation of voters, hmm. the importance of advertising around delivery you know, is, is not something that we in the political economy universe talk enough about because we sort of take it as I got it, therefore my preference is this, or I didn't get it, my preference is that. Uh, but in fact, there is this complicated, um, uh, and this is a conversation Yamini and I have been having on, uh, on the sidelines as well. There's a complicated relationship between what is delivered to you, how much is delivered to you, and how much attribution you give to various political leaders, right? Now, quickly on the spoiler thing, um, you know, one of the tricky things about, you know, thinking about voting from a strategic perspective is that spoilers really shouldn't happen, right? In, in sort of a game, <laughs> in a game theory sense, right? So, so people should be sufficiently strategic to not vote for somebody against, uh, you know, a candidate that they would rather see. Um, what I would say is that despite us sort of blithely using that kind of spoiler terminology, um, there's something more complicated that happens in these kinds of contexts. The Paswan vote is an unusually consolidated vote, right? And just like arguments that have been made about regional parties at the center, when you trust your leader to bargain on behalf of your caste or on some, some other grouping, you vote for them, even if they act a spoiler, and then you allow them to negotiate for you. Why vote for a regional party in a national election, right? Why vote for LJP in a state election, right? Um, I think the logics are probably, if we were to go back to a lot of LJP voters and Paswan voters, you would see a very similar logic emerge. Hmm. Okay. Rahul, can I just say one more thing just to, uh, in, in the context of what Neelan was, was saying, uh, 
to that particular question since uh, it, it's something that we've been discussing quite a bit and I can't, can't help myself. Uh, but, you know, just one thing, if you look at the interesting thing about the uh, post-lockdown um, uh, entire, the, uh, the, 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 the subsidy package that was given, the PMGKY, uh, what is really interesting about this is that the little limited amount of independent data that we have now that is telling us about delivery tells us that to a degree the public distribution system actually work well uh, but the cash system didn't work well at all and it plays out even in a lot of what Vandita was saying chawal mila uh, 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 gehu mila but we didn't have money to buy the pulses etc cetera, etc cetera. now from the point of view of uh, and, and here's the interesting thing although the PDS system is very centralized actually it's the state and Bihar has under Nitish Kumar done a lot of good reforms on the PDS and even though there's corruption the corruption levels have reduced but on this movement of cash even in a dbt world and the indian express did some interesting uh, reportage on this uh, recently looking at bihar and uh, jharkhand corruption hasn't gone down but the attribution of corruption is very much uh, linked to the local panchayat structure because that is the lived experience of corruption so again you know uh, some things that modi gave so called and very cleverly in june the extension of the uh, subsidy was made all the way through till after Chhat Puja with a clear eye on the Bihar elections. There was no pandemic logic to why we were doing it in November and not till December, January or February. So I think there's also been a very interesting, careful calibration of ensuring that what is working stays very much in the uh, credit taking for the, the, the BJP. And what is not working is just ignored so that the local context then can play its own narrative around where those problems lie. And, and I, you know, I think this is not just Bihar specific, but it's an interesting play on this central local story. So uh, BJP takes credit for all this welfare, but its welfare is very carefully designed in a way that it actually doesn't then have to take the hit for failure either. Mm -hmm. Tabriz, uh, uh, can I, uh, so, so there's a question for you. Your presentation was really interesting, especially, I think, uh, especially given the amount of money Congress is spending, uh, uh, given the number of seats they contested and got, uh, is it, uh, uh, what do you think, is it Congress, like, uh, not able to hide the money like other parties when they are spending on, on these platforms via different channels? Or is it the problem is much more of basically, uh, you know, uh, the content in their sort of like Facebook campaigns and other things? Why is it not yielding effect? Or as Vandita ji said, uh, especially, like, especially digital campaigns, at least for now in Bihar, don't have any uh, effect. Yeah, I, I agree. There are multiple factors that affect uh, voting behavior. And the campaign is very important in the sense that most of the political party spend huge amount of money in campaign. And that's why that's where you shape your perception. So even if something is going on, so whom, like the previous point, the political economy aspect of campaign, so whom do you attribute for the improvement in the living condition? This could be shaped by campaign and that's what is happening with the Modi government, you know, so a lot of money they have been spending on campaign to improve their perceptions, the way they are targeting, like you can do all the blame on the opposition, but when it comes to the good thing, you can always attribute it to Modi. And mm -hmm. that kind of disconnect you can see from the Modi and then Nitish Kumar. So here, so there is a direct relationship between, so for example, demonetization, people suffered a lot, they, most of 90% of the populations were affected by demonetizations, but the way it was framed in the media, nobody attributed the blame on Modi. Mm. Look at the campaign here. So that's where I think uh, we need to look at very seriously the political communication research, unfortunately, is not so well developed in India as compared to US and Europe. And that's where we don't have sufficient tools to study how do we make sense of some of these development. And that's where you look at uh, what is happening in terms of the Congress campaign, coming back to this uh, question, you have to really learn from BJP, right from uh, Gujarat to 2014 election, the way they design campaigns So political, when you design an advertising, it's not just you just 
design and relay it. You have to test it. You have to uh, really look at whether it's working or not. And that's where the campaign and these uh, PR managers are very important. And in that way, the personalization of campaign that is happening. So the leadership is very important. And that's where Tejashvi Yadav was able to mobilize because there is personalization of the politics. And that's why Modi is important, Nitish Kumar is important, and Tejashvi Yadav is important. And look at Congress party ad. All, almost 90% of the ads were about party. Oh, they have done very good in the past. In the uh, they have participated in freedom struggle. Who remembers these kind of things? And whether you are really targeting it well or not. And that's where I showed you the figure. BJP was not spending anything in the beginning. Towards the end, they really, really jacked up the spending. So that's where I think we have to look at some of these things very critically instead of dismissing them. Digital campaign may or may not have played a role, but you cannot like 26% of the voter and look at the margin in most of the seats. You, okay. you know, like 20 seats were less than 100, uh, 1000 um, margin. And that's where I think you have to even cannot ignore the power of any platform, even if it's marginal. Okay. Uh, Jill, uh, I know you can only do this. Uh, two questions, uh, answer in uh, one minute each. <laughs> one is basically, uh, uh, Indrajit Roy is asking about uh, uh, any sort of like impact of uh, CA NRC narratives on Bihar election. And do you think given the results in Simanchal where MIM had done well, will it have any sort of like effect on neighboring states of Assam and Bihar, which will poll in six months? Mm, thank you. Um, I think if it hadn't been for I mean contest contesting a small number of seats, no one would have spoken about or even evoked, you know, the presence of Muslim voters in the first place. They would have just assumed how they'll go, they'll back, you know, the Mahagar Banan against the NDA. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. And uh, I mean, you know, contest in Simanshal, which is one of the region in India where the Muslims are the poorest. Yeah. So uh, I was not on the ground, so I, I cannot say whether CAA had an impact or not. Maybe Vanita has insights about this. Uh, but my sense is that it would be uh, one issue among many others that Muslims face uh, in, those, uh, in, those, in those regions. Uh, unemployment, poverty, um, and a general sense of abandonment from the state um, as well. Vandita ji, last question to you and the question has been asked by an anonymous attendee the person has not named himself or herself is basically i think uh, you made a very interesting point about tejasvi not being uh, sort of kejar uh, like kejriwal uh, and the question is uh, like i don't know how we see this but uh, the, is there was another person uh, 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 an alternative uh, like pushpam priya chaudhary uh, LSC educated, fresh face, why not uh, uh, she becoming an alternative? Or what would they just we have to do to become uh, like, uh, sort of like, at least promising like Kejriwal in case of Bihar? Yeah, so Kejriwal is not simply the clean slate. Kejriwal is a clean slate in the sense that he doesn't bring a baggage of the past, but he's also a narrative. So you, the India against corruption movement, which continued for I think before the Aam Admi Party was launched, uh, that created that narrative, built that narrative, that anti-corruption plank. Kejriwal had these things, a, a, a sort of a problem working for him, which is that there was this government which was seen to be discredited and corrupt. And here was this guy, an outsider who doesn't have the scars, a, a scarred past record, uh, coming with a narrative against corruption. So what they just we probably needs. I mean, uh, so uh, Pushpam Priya is is somebody who doesn't have a narrative. She's just she's probably got the clean slate, but she doesn't have the narrative. Uh, what they just we needs to do is he doesn't have the clean slate either. He he has Lalu who and Lalu is 
a two-faced figure. Lalu is a huge, huge advantage for the RJD because it is because of Lalu that you know the whole social justice politics and its plank is defined. And Lalu, even today, in fact, I am always struck by the fact that even in 2020, in again in every group of lower caste voters that I spoke to, one person at least would stand up and say that you know Lalu ji gave me my voice. The fact that I can stand here or the fact I can sit here on the same chair, I mean, along with you, is because Lalu ji gave me that confidence. So as much as Lalu is an advantage to the RGD, the fact is also that Lalu has become a constraint as well. Because in the last years of Lalu, you know, Lalu lost the plot too and he allowed his coalition to, be, to shrink into a Muslim Yadav. Um, formation alone. And within that, there was Yadav dominance and the Yadav, you know, lumpenism as well. So um, Tejasvi that way does not have a clean slate. He has both the advantage, but also the, the disadvantage of Lalu. And he now has to build a narrative which maximizes the advantage and minimizes the disadvantage. But that there is no shortcut to it as this election has shown. He needs to work at it. He needs that narrative to become a Kejriwal like figure. Again, this is not an endorsement of any kind of Kejriwal. It is just the phenomenon. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. We have completely run off out of time. Uh, this was great discussion. Uh, I learned a lot of things. Uh, so thank you, Vandita Ji, Jeel, Tabriz, uh, Neela, and Yamini, and everyone who joined us today, despite listening to so many things about Bihar for last three weeks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.